Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. This is Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. I'm Gary Heil. Today's guest is Jill Ellis, the most successful national women's team coach in U.S. soccer history. During her time at the helm of the national team, she won two World Cups in 2015 and 2019. And in winning back-to-back World Cups, Jill did something that hadn't been done in either men's soccer or women's soccer since 1934 in winning back-to-back Cups. During her time at the helm of the national team, She won more than 87% of the games the team played while reinventing the culture of the team to prepare it for the future. Before her national team experience, Jill built a dominant program at UCLA where she made eight NCAA College Cup appearances, won six straight Pac-10 titles, won more than 80% of their games, and was voted National Coach of the Year for taking the Bruins to the national championship game in only her second year in Westwood. Welcome, Coach. Thanks for spending some time with us this morning. My pleasure. Delighted to be here. Jill, as we begin, I want to take you to the most uncomfortable time, probably, or one of them in your coaching history. I like to go back to 2016, the Olympic Games. You were just off a World Cup victory in 2015, and you're playing Sweden in the Olympics. You play them to a draw in regular time and extra time, and then you lose four to three in penalty kicks, and you have a choice. As the leader of the team, you either have to choose to stick with what must have been one of the most dominant and strongest you know, cultures in sports history, really, with the women's team, to stick with it and try to improve it or to reinvent that culture for the future. Do I have that about right? Yes, it was obviously a, an incredibly successful program, um, you know, steeped in winning tradition. But, it, you know, it was, yeah, it was, it was a massive fail, probably the biggest fail we've ever had in our program's history. And so the decision was, you know, I, I think I described it as a reboot. And it was this decision to kind of reset, reevaluate. And I think as a culture, you know, cultures, you can take all the great qualities that there are in a culture. Um, you know, the competitive edge this program had from all the way back to the 90s, that's something you just never want to lose. You want to take those, those cornerstones with you, but you also need to make sure that you're constantly evolving that. And, you know, accountability is, is a, a massive piece of this program's culture. And how do you modernize accountability? Well, now you've got a lot of um, analytics, you have data to reinforce sometimes, you know, things that you're looking for specifically in a performance. Um, So I think there are ways of trying to bring those core values into the current time and making sure that they are adaptable and that they are uh, gonna resonate with the current generation. But it had to be a little risky. I mean, you're you're trying to change something that couldn't want to change very much in some ways, right? It's a tough choice because there's a risk to a, to a leader to try to upend the most successful culture in that team's history. Yeah, it's, you know, when, when players get into that, there's this history, a long history of players being in that environment for long periods of time. And I really felt, because what I was actually looking at was where our game was trending, where our, you know, our, our workplace was, was heading in a certain direction. I needed to make sure I had this, the, the players and the, and the profile of employees almost that were going to make sure that they could meet the demands of that where, where we were headed. And so, you know, one of the things I really looked at is the profile of the players and then making sure we had this infusion of new players. Was there a massive risk to that? Yes, because when you bring in young players and you commit to playing them you know, in big games, it's not like you're just going to bleed them in slowly. You run the risk of losing, which is pretty unprecedented with this program. You also, you know, have to make tough decisions about some senior players that potentially aren't going to continue on this journey. And I think as a leader, what you, what you have to do is you make sure you, um, 
you almost have to get ahead of this and lay out what you're proposing to your shareholders. You know, here's my bosses. This is what I'm planning on doing. To the players themselves, we're about to go on this through this period that's going to be uncomfortable, that's going to challenge us and stretch us. But then it's reminding them that to be successful, we cannot be uh, status quo. We've got to continue to climb and evolve. And that means, you know, with the players that are coming in and also the players that are already embedded in the program. It's, it's another example of what many leaders must face every day, right? You, you've been successful in the past and the world just changing so quickly around you. I take it women's soccer the same way that you either innovate or, or you start to lose. And it, it, that must have been part of your feeling. Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think the, the rest of the world, we, we did way back when we had an advantage, we had an edge. But that gap had closed. And so now it was incumbent on us to make sure that we, if we wanted to be the trendsetters, we had to be um, the leaders, whether it was tactically in our flexibility and in our strategy, whether it was bringing in players that could meet the demands of that environment, as I was saying. Um, so it really was a time where it was almost an experimental period for a while. And with that came the challenges, you know, you're, your players on board are going to start to question. They're going to start to, um, you know, challenge in terms of we're uncomfortable. We, we're not used to losing. I was experimenting with the different strategies and systems. And so I think all in all, it was a, it was a tough period on everybody. But I think on the backside of that change, through that struggle, we came out the backside a better team, um, a more rich team in terms of our profile of our players and definitely a more flexible uh, dominant team in terms of our play. And you had to say goodbye to some pretty famous players. Certainly. I mean, you know, when you, you know, and again, I think as a leader, you sort of, you put that out front, but then when you, re when you deal with the reality of having to tell a player that their role is either not going to be a part of this or their role is going to shift dramatically, then you kind of really have to have, make sure you have excellent clarity in your message. Um, you know, I think with players, I think for me, what I try and do is, is be very honest, but also manage with empathy. Like you understand that this is going to be different, but you try and push them through it. But then you never want to be in a situation where a player is going to um, take from that environment in some capacity. They've either got to figure it out and get on board or it's not going to, they're not going to be a part of this journey. And those are the tough decisions you have to make as leaders, um, because at some point, and I said this to some of our players, I don't need you to love your role. I need you to execute your role. And that's, you know, I think at the professional level, everybody has to have this team first uh, mentality in terms of what we try and do. Did you see this coming before the Sweden loss? I mean, when you lost to Sweden, was it a total, you must have been thinking about this before. You must have seen it coming before the event that shifted everybody else's thinking. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a great point because I think, you know, in that, in that roster for the Olympics, I'd actually brought in a couple of young players because what I knew as a coach was the Olympics was actually the first event, world event, before our next World Cup. And if we wanted to get these players significant experience, these younger players, we need to bring them in. I think I brought an 18-year-old to the Olympics. And so, yeah, I did feel that we would have to kind of have this, you know, we had a, a slightly aging roster. We had new exciting players that were waiting in the wings. And so I, I was anticipating that would, there would be this shift. However, obviously when you, when you come up against a massive failure as we did, it, it only accentuates you know, the, the, the decisions that you have to make in terms of um, being, being adaptable to change, embracing it. So when you, when you say adaptable to change, Jill, it, one of the really interesting things is in, in the at least in the theory of change, is that people tend to change better when they're unfrozen, when they feel the need to change, when they see that what they want to do tomorrow, they're not going to get there the way they're doing it today. Did the game with Sweden do that for most players? Or did you have to show them even more evidence that the way they were going wasn't going to be successful in the future? Well, I, I think it's twofold. I think what you have to also recognize when you're dealing with you know, elite players, um, you know, they have their own agenda in terms of, you know, they got to take care of themselves. And so I think, you know, some of them that, you know, probably their skill set best suited the game the moment we were in. 
we're probably going to struggle if we were going to shift and be adaptive in terms of our future, how we were going to look. So I don't think, you know, everybody was, was probably um, open to this. I mean, you share that message with them, but the reality is when you leave a player off of a roster to make room for a younger player or a player sitting on the bench that, that arguably has been a starter, um, you know, they're going to try it initially to make sure that it's, you know, how am I affected? And that's natural. That's human, right, in terms of how it influences me. So I think it was, um, it was not something that everybody saw or probably everybody initially thought needed to happen. You know, one of my, one of my starting players after our 2019 World Cup Kelly O'Hara, I mean, I, one of her quotes was, it was an incredibly hard time we went through, but looking back on it, it was absolutely necessary. And I think that's how a lot of the players felt. You know, we were, we were more uh, demanding of them in terms of uh, our tactical nuances. Um, we had more depth to the roster. So there wasn't this sense of, you know, this is our starting 11 for three years. It was, uh, you know, very... Um, fluid group for a while until we settled on our on our starting 11. So I think, you know, some of the players recognized it and understood it. And obviously the young players coming in, they're like, brilliant. This is, you know, <laughs> this is my opportunity, so to speak. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag when you're going through change. Everybody reacts differently. And, and conflict's inevitable, right? I mean, sometimes I think today, many leaders and organizations talk about change as if you can go through it without the conflict as if we're going to talk about change. People are going to turn their life upside down and sing Kumbaya at the end of every night. Right. I don't think that's how it works. Right. No. I mean, again, it's, it's what, how does it impact me is usually the first, you know, the first natural human emotion. It's like, you know, as am I going to be on this team? Am I going to be a part of this? And in this modern age now of our game where, you know, branding and, you know, marketability and all these things come into play for an athlete, you know, it's a massive difference between sitting on the bench or being on the pitch. So, you know, I think that's natural. Certainly, you know, I think I had some challenging conversations, you know, and I think you have to have those. And again, I think what was my guiding principle and what made it easier for me was I always said, this is what's best for the team in, in, internally. It was like, you know, sometimes you are, if you're cutting a player, you're crushing their dreams. But the way you can kind of navigate that is because we're all human and we all understand that that's painful, but it's almost like, you know, what do you have to do that's going to best help this team get across the finish line? And that was kind of, I leaned on that a lot because I'm a sensitive person and I, you know, you don't really want to offend people or hurt people, but the reality is the team has to come first. And that was, um, you know, again, some, some very frank dis discussions with players. Well, it gives, the, it gives people a reason to sacrifice, right? I mean, in, it, oh. we sacrifice to become part of a team, no matter what we're doing, curing cancer, playing soccer. It, it, we, when we're part of a team, if the team doesn't come first, we're just a group of individuals and self-interest is all there is. So it, this team first thing must be something that you, you basically had convinced everybody, this is what we're about consistently, right? Correct. I mean, I think when you have basically an all-star team that any player on this, on this team could play for any other team in the world and start and play 90 minutes every game, then how do you make sure that each one of those players feels valued? Because, you know, it, when you get closer to a world event, you need an established hierarchy. You can't suddenly have people doubting what's my role because then it, then it opens itself up for a lot of gray areas and people struggle in gray areas. So as we got closer to a world event, the hierarchy, you know, this is our starting group, this is our game, these are our game changers, was set. But it's imperative that every single player on that roster from one to 23 makes it known, makes it felt that they are important, they're valued, and we don't get across this finish line. We don't get to the top of the podium without their sacrifice, without their input. And how did we do that? We did that in a multitude of ways. You know, it was calling our substitutes game changers instead of subs. It was making sure every time I was out in front of the media, I would talk about it's going to take 23 to win. Like you, there are ways that you can shape the narrative to make people understand that their, their contribution is important. This, this idea, I, I, I want to go back to the, the team concept, but I, I love the term that I think you guys invented this game changers versus substitutes that we always called them in soccer. You know, you'd say, might say on one side, what's in a name, but words are sort of a window to your soul as somebody's once said. And it really not only helps with the person to realize that their role is to change the game, 
but it probably helps the coach understand exactly how that person is supposed to change the game too, right? Absolutely. I mean, people would say, you know, when you came down to picking your last three or four players for this team, you know, what did it come down to? Did it come down to chemistry? Did it come down to an investment in the future? And I would, it was very clear to me, every single player was there because they were going to help us be successful. And what I mean by that is a substitute, a game changer comes in the game to actually do that. Whether we're trying to protect a lead or whether we're trying to force a goal, there's a role. And so how can they, if, if they're a brilliant game changer, they can come on in either scenario, but it's, there's a purpose in them being there. They understand why they're there. Um, you know, one of the things I really tried to do is make sure, because often as coaches and as leaders, we focus on our core group. And one of the things I was very clear to my coaches about is everybody needs to get the same level of attention, the same amount of information. So, you know, if we were going through um, a setup in terms of walking through something, it was everybody was there, everybody was getting the same information because that reinforced that at any moment we could have a player come in and they would know exactly how to execute their role. So it was very, very important to have this, um, not just in how we, we verbalized it, but also how we visualized it. I started every meeting after our matches. So we would play a match, the next day we'd have a review meeting. Every meeting started not with visuals of the starting group, but of visuals of our bench celebrating and it again reinforces the other thing that it does is it also makes the players that are the starters realize there's somebody there who's breathing down my neck who's very very influential who's very good so it also helps promote that they they can't ever take their foot off the gas so to speak yeah and when you talk about the team so it's one thing to say team first right but there there must be a vision for how this team was going to be different so change kind of begs the question of change from something to something. And you must have had a picture that you painted of how they would be better and different when it comes to 2019, when you started this in 2016. Absolutely. I think one of the, one of the decisions when you're an architect for something and you're building something, it's, you know, you look at your players and you can either say, this is my vision of how the game looks and I'm gonna make these players fit my vision. Or you can look at the strengths and assets that you have, and you can build a team that harnesses that. So one of the pitches to the players was we, sh we shifted our, our lineup in terms of how we aligned on the field. And it was, it was reminding the players that we are putting you in positions where each one of you is gonna have an opportunity to, to shine and to play in the best area on the field that's gonna harness your strengths. That was a massive sales pitch in terms of, you know, getting their buy-in for suddenly playing a completely different system. I think the other thing that we, that we reinforced with them was we had to evolve tactically. Teams now, you could go and you could do a scouting report on a team and you say, this is what they're gonna do. And then on game day, they're doing something completely different because they're adjusting. And so it really begged the, begged the question for us, we can prepare all we want, but at the end of the day, we have to have players that can recognize and problem solve on the pitch, that have this built in um, core principles to lean on. So I liken it to this, I'm sure you're a golfer, is you know, when you play golf, you, you're gonna be in the sand trap, you're gonna be on the fairway, you're gonna be in the putting green. You need a club for every one of those scenarios. So what we did was we equipped our players and our team with strategies that regardless of what our opponent did, we knew we were gonna be in the driver's seat. We knew that we had uh, an answer for that. And not just an answer to defend something, but an answer to exploit something in our opponent. So did you find it was, I mean, what you did was you took a team, although you lost to Sweden on penalty kicks, right? And it seems right. like a, you call it a massive failure. You're, you lost on penalty kicks, come on. And then, you know, you sit there, you're at the, this team has been dominant on the world stage or, you know, for a while. And you're at the top of your game in a way that the team is just as a culture, as a program is, is extraordinary. And you created this change in culture while they're at the top. Do you figure it was an advantage for you to decide to make the change while you were still near the top of your profession? For sure. Um, you know, I think, listen, the reality of my profession is if I hadn't won the World Cup in 2015, if we hadn't won that after 2016, I wouldn't have been the coach. That's just the reality of what we do in, in our sport. There's a, there's a legendary coach named Sir Alex Ferguson, and he was renowned for winning a massive title, winning a big title, and then immediately changing things up 
at the very top. And it was something that resonated with me because, you know, the way I look at competition, you know, I, I've said this a lot, it's you're either trying to close a gap in competition because you're not the lead dog or you're trying to create separation and that space and how you navigate it. That's sometimes the difference between success and failure. And so what I recognize with our, with our team is we had to compete against ourselves, so to speak, because we were number one in the world. Um, and how can we improve and how can we change things? So we're constantly evolving. There's this beautiful, um, term in they use in Europe is called aggregation of marginal gains. And what it really is, is you look at a hundred things and you improve them by 1%. And then the aggregate of that puts you over. And when you're incredibly successful, you're probably not going to change 50% because you're already the best you are. Usain Bolt is not going to knock 10 seconds off of his time. So you're looking for these marginal incremental uh, gains. And then I think it's looking at what areas can we actually grow in? And I felt for us, our tactical flexibility, our depth, our, um, the players, the types of players that we had in certain positions, the profiles, those, those were all areas where I felt we could make strides. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, as much as the loss was hard, I think, Knowing our program, I knew we had to continue to grow, even if we'd won the Olympics. So when we won in 2015, I said to the players, congrats, you're on the summit, you're the best in the world, but now we've got to climb again. I think that's very much the mindset of a successful organization, company, program, individual. It's often been said that it's harder to stay on top than to get on top for that very reason, because so often when you're the winner, when you've got the culture that has a history of winning, success blinds you to what's possible. And you can get comfortable with success. And sometimes you say, but if I change tactics and strategy and all the things you were talking about, I, I might not be as good. That's how they protect and how culture tends to re re retard your ability to improve, right? That's Very why so many teams, I mean, when, when I was given the introduction, think about it. two World Cups in a row hadn't happened since 1934. Yeah. Right. There's a reason why teams don't repeat. Right. And why innovative teams have a chance. It's very true. I think when you when you have success, you're, you know, one of the things that I learned as a young player is, you know, if you one of my coaches says, if you if you go into a match and you worry about losing, you're going to lose. And so this, you know, because the more success you have, the more you almost want to protect it. So when we went into the 2019 World Cup, we were the defending champions and all the media were like, you're the defending champions. Well, that suddenly makes it feel like you're already in this posture of you're protecting something. And I said to Fox, Fox Sports, who were our partners in the World Cup, to every single media and to my players, we're not defending anything. No one can take that away from us. We are now going to attack this next World Cup. So that whole mindset of, you know, really not sitting and being comfortable, being static. That's, you know, I think that's part of, you know, I always said this as a leader, if you're the same leader last year that you are today, you're failing in a way because you've got to continue to grow. Well, I, that is true about leadership, right? As we, we talk about that, that if, if it's not a lifelong learning thing, then it's difficult. But, you know, learning is, a, is an interesting deal because we tend to think of learning as this fun thing, but learning can create significant anxiety. It's hard to rethink your thinking, right? I mean, here you were, Joe, you, you, you created a, a dominant program at UCLA, you come into the national program, you have great success, you, you know, and to rethink your thinking about what coaching will be in 2019 versus 2016 means you have to look in the mirror, become self-aware and see yesterday is not good enough, right? That's, that Correct. can create some anxiety, right? Certainly, because I think especially when you are, you know, you, you have players that are very established, that are world beaters, and now you're asking them to change the role. I mean, Carly Lloyd scored a hat trick in the 2015 World Cup. In 2019, she's on the bench. And that's a hard adjustment. But that is, you know, part of when you're looking at something and you're looking at what you need. Um, yeah, were those some, some tough conversations? Were those some moments of like, you know, here's my captain, you know, are you doing the right thing here, Jill? But, you've, you know, again, it's, it's 
the conviction of what you believe. You know, I was asked in press conferences when we lost a couple of games in this period of experimentation, are you going to lose, you're afraid of losing your job? You think you're going to lose your job? And I would just fire back, you know, I'm, I'm not coaching to keep my job. I'm coaching in what I believe. But yeah, there's moments when you're not on that podium, you're not on that sideline, when you're just with yourself and you're kind of like, wow, <laughs> you know, this, that whole period was probably my toughest period in coaching 2017 because it was, you know, it's not back in college where nobody really is aware of what you're doing. This is millions of people with an opinion about what you're doing. And so it's, it's, it's not letting that influence you for sure, but it's making sure that you're steadfast in what you believe. But at, at times, I think that's where leaders have to be courageous, you know, and, and kind of make those big, tough decisions. Well, yeah, and after you win the World Cup in 2019, it all seems so easy in 2017, now that you see the path that, <laughs> that the change led to. But in 2017, there had to be a few people out for your, for your, for your scalp, and they had to be, a lot of players even chirping about, you know, where are we going? Am I wrong about that? No, 100% right. I mean, I think when, when there is, um, you know, when, when something is struggling, whether I think whether it's a business or relationship, usually there's three things that, that for me come into play. And, you know, it typically could be strategy, like what's our direction? What's our plan here? invariably it's always communication i don't care you know <laughs> where i've been communication is always there's a lack of communication um you know so strategy and communication and then i think it's um oftentimes it's just this um commitment to following through you know are, are we are we sure this is the right path kind of thing and so yeah i think when players suddenly we lost some games i'm bringing new players there were three or four players that certainly were they were impacted and I know they were stressed, then they're going to start to question. And, you know, again, I think as a leader, you'd be naive to think that even when you're not coaching a team, when you're in an office space, that there aren't people thinking, is this the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? But again, I think you have to stay true to kind of what you believe. But certainly, I mean, you know, make no bounds about it. Some of my players want to be out. Uh, I get that. I understand that. You know, my administration, because I think, Gary, I'd said to them, this is going to be a tough period. Are you on board with this? Because I preempted what was probably going to happen, the, it almost left them no choice to say, yes, we're going to continue. Um, and so, you know, they made a, a statement to publicly and to the players, hey, Jill's our coach through 2019. Um, you know, at that point, you, you, it's not even validating. You, you just realize you have the control back because, you know, at times if, if your employees are going directly to your supervisors and you feel left out of that, um, that chain, it's, it's a little unsettling. And that's where you just have to trust that, you know, that the people that you've educated in terms of what your plan is are going to stand by you. Yeah, so you have, you have real clarity as to what you're trying to do and you've told your bosses and they agree. And that agreement as to that vision that you're trying to create becomes sort of a, once you get the agreement, sort of creates a culture of psychological safety for the coach that allows the coach to coach. Yes, it, it, you would, one would hope. I mean, I think, you know, still it's, you know, when you're, because I think, you know, if I'm honest in, in now in this modern age of, of coaching and players, you know, the the social media and the, and the fan following, I think sometimes leaders, you know, top, top, you know, management and, and board, I think sometimes, you know, the public opinion can, or a player's, um, you know, a person's ability to influence public opinion with millions of followers on Twitter. I think that sometimes um, makes people maybe question, you know, can I, can I follow through on this because the influence of, of people's opinions, I mean, we see it all the time. So I think that was something that was, you know, did I know until actually my boss stood in front of my team and said, she's going to be on the sidelines in France. The rest of you need to get on board. I mean, that, you know, that's something that I think, but that's not uncommon for coaching. I mean, when I got into coaching, my father said, Jill, you're not coaching until you've been fired. I'm like, what a terrible <laughs> thing to say. But the reality is that's just the nature of our business. Um, but, you know, again, I, I think it was just a, uh, for me, it was, it was a hard period. It's, it's tough to know that some of your players aren't on board or aren't happy with your decisions. But again, it's, it's this resolve that you have to have. And, and, and there's a certain amount of fear that's inevitable in those things, right? Even for your players, when, 
when I'm competing every day for a spot and your culture was, as you, I think you would describe as very competitive culture, right? Day in and day out in practice. And there's a part of that that I might lose my job if I'm not really getting better. I'm either getting better or I'm not going to be here, right? I'm improving, I'm learning, I'm becoming more adaptable. But at the same time, I have to be psychologically safe enough to perform at my best because nobody plays well scared, right? Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's where I, you know, I understood where the, the space they were coming from because, you know, if you're putting a player out with, with different players around them every single day, that's going to affect their ability to get into a rhythm, to really understand the players. So every time I was in front of the media, I would always shoulder that responsibility, you know, never criticize the players. I was like, you know what, I'm, yes, I'm mixing things up. I'm changing these things. This is, you know, by design. And yes, it's going to be hard. To, to try and alleviate some of that, you know, pressure or criticism that would come on them. So I totally appreciated the space they were in. Um, you know, it, it was an, a necessary phase for us to go through. But, you know, as I said, it was very uncomfortable. And that's why it's so important that once you come through that gauntlet, as I, as I referenced <laughs> it to them, on the back side of this, you know, it was now saying, we're going to be unstoppable. We're going to win the gold medal. We're going to, and it's that reinforcing that, yes, this hardship was, needed but now we are so good and we're so strong and as i said to you then you kind of re-establish the hierarchy so people feel um in a safe space in terms of their roles and their responsibilities and what they're doing is that why um as you were saying a little earlier is that why you created more stability closer to the world cup or closer to big events that you compete you compete you compete but so many months so many weeks out you create more stability to create more safety so that people learn to work together better and don't feel like they're looking over their shoulder? Absolutely, 100%. You know, when I was a younger coach, I was coaching um, the under 21 youth national team. And I remember saying to one of my captains, I don't understand, they just don't seem like they're really gelling. And she looked at me and she said, Jill, you gotta name the roster. Name the roster and we'll be thick as thieves, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> it was just kind of a real, you know, you're right. When you put that roster in, no longer are you individuals fighting for a spot. You are one team, one nation, as kind of we go. Um, it certainly galvanized us. And I think, you know, this 2019 team, probably because it had been a tough road, you know, and I think they said this, it was probably the club, one of the closest teams I've ever worked with in terms of their personal connection to each other. Let's talk about that personal connection, because in Every time over the years that I've seen you interviewed, and I, I believe it's probably fundamental to your belief about culture, is this idea of connection, positive connection, you with the players and the players with each other. And when you watch the 2019 team, you can't be confused. They're calling themselves a family. They're talking about their sisters. They're professing their love. That's been part of your belief since UCLA days, right? That you, the fundamental part of building a culture is to build human connections among the entire team, including your staff. Absolutely. You know, it, it, you spend so much time together. It really is. I mean, you think of the natural connection that you have with your family members, and that's not without sometimes conflict or, you know, discord. But I think the, you know, for me in principle, understanding, you know, I like to say the fabric of people's lives. I think it's important for players and my staff and I think I grew in this recognition um, that they matter as people. I think when people feel valued and feel like they have something to offer, they're going to you know, run through a brick wall, metaphorically speaking. And so it was knowing more about people and than just what you see at practice or just what you see. And it's understanding, you know, with an assistant coach, it's making sure they are privy to all the decisions you make as a head coach, because at some point you want them to go on and be a head coach. It's that knowing what they want and, and where their goals are. So I think truly understanding and connecting with people is, um, you know, I think it's fundamental to, to, to human relationship, especially when you're in a environment where there's this constant need for this flow of information. You have to get 23 people on the same page. I had a staff of 30 that had to, we had to be a well-oiled machine. That doesn't happen without this, this understanding and this um, built-in ideal of re mutual respect and, and uh, not even admiration, but this mutual respect for each other that makes things click. So, you know, asking my assistant coach, what is 
what his kids are going to be for Halloween. You know, just acknowledges that I know he's a parent. Knowing that Rose Lavelle's bulldog's named Wilma, you talk to them sometimes about things outside of the job. And I think that's important. Now, that's not to say that you're going to have the same relationship with everybody. I mean, human dynamics lend that. But I feel like it was something that I truly believe to have a, a high uh, functioning organization team, we had to have built in connections to each other. But it's not a tactic, right? That, that doesn't work when it's a tactic, right? If I'm asking somebody what their dog's name is, because I think it <laughs> might look like my leadership tactic, this has to be a real genuine caring, yes. a, an actual well wishing for the good of others, even if they're not going to play, even if they're not talented enough to be on our team, you have to care about them. You can't fake that, right? No, that, yeah, those, that information comes out through, you know, through getting to know people, through, you know, loving people. I mean, I think, you know, when I got into coaching, what I loved most about it was, was this human element, this connection to try and help people achieve something that they're, they're striving to achieve. Um, that, that's a special journey you go on with people, you know, it's, and it's not a, it's not a smooth sailing journey. So you, I think sometimes as a, as a coach, you know, you have to be able to, throw your arm around someone and sometimes you have to kick them in the tail and walking that line. You can't do that unless you really have a sense of that person. It's, it's knowing how maybe one player responds to getting information on the pitch in the middle of practice and another player maybe responds better watching video in your, in your office. And that's trying to really understand what people need and what people respond to. And they have to trust you have their best interest at heart. I would guess, huh? Yeah, you would. Yeah, you hope so. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I think my players knew that, you know, I, I, I cared about them as people. Um, you know, I think the I think some of the, the best moments I've had or, you know, even away from the soccer field with some of the, you know, some of the players and just these, these lighter hearted moments that you find yourself in. Yeah. So so that makes the selection of your staff, especially your assistant coaches super important, right? Because if they don't share your values, it sort of undermines your whole vision of what you're trying to do. What were the criteria? Many of us in hiring people, it's, you know, it's, it's a tough job to hire the right people. And how do you get the right people on the staff? That's a, that's a good question, especially sometimes because you inherit, you know, you inherit staff um, and you right. don't always have the luxury of, of bringing in, you know, your own people. Um, so I think, you know, it's, again, I, I think people, people struggle with gray. And what, what I mean by that, if people truly understand, hey, here's, here's the expectation, here's the responsibility, here's the roles, you really got to craft it out there, then there becomes this they have a real sense of what you, what you, what's important to you because of how you uh, deliver that message and the things that you value in that message. And they also understand um, that you're trusting them with these responsibilities and you're trying to, again, build that connection. I, I like to liken my staff to a, a group of people that fill in each other's gaps. And, you know, when I think about, like, what do we want to present to the team? We want this tight-knit, comprehensive group of um, people, whether it's medical, whether it's technical staff, that can give world-class service to these players to help them succeed. And I think when I looked at, you know, building my staff, it was that I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses. It was making sure that, you know, potentially um, something that doesn't come natural to me and I see it in this person, but maybe they're not doing that just this moment. It's, it's nurturing that, it's encouraging that, it's building that. You know, I think my assistant who started with me, one of my assistants who started with me in 2015, for his role from, from 15 to 19, I mean, it, it grew exponentially. And that was us building this trust with each other. So I think filling each other's gaps is a, is a very base way of saying we just complemented each other in our skill sets and then truly believed. I think one of the things also as a leader with your staff is you have to create the environment you want. Meaning if you want to be, and when I was young, I was this coach. If you want to always be right and want everybody to agree with you, then you really don't allow people time to kind of get their thoughts out and, and you kind of come across in this way. If you want to be this collaborative person that says that person is world-class at what they, they do, I want to hear from them, then you have to facilitate that or encourage that. I think what I grew to realize is nothing frustrates me more when I have 
um, people that won't give an opinion, like just sit on that fence pole. You know, I would rather have someone be passionate about something and us disagree and knowing that my staff, because of the relationships we built, regardless of whether I made the decision agreed with them or not, they would support what I did. That's a high functioning staff. In this transition, do you have to ask any of the staff to leave? Um, it's, uh, yes. I mean, I think, you know, well, one of the, one of the hard things I had to do was we created this new position and I actually hired someone I'd worked with outside of, um, the women's national team and brought them in because I thought it'd be a great fit. And this person is a world-class human being, uh, it was a dear friend, world-class human being, but it just wasn't the right fit in terms of the role of in, within the job. And that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was to basically say, you know, we, we can't continue in, in this, uh, you know, to this day, this person doesn't speak to me. And that was a really hard thing. Um, it was painful and it was stressful. But I, again, if, if your compass is what does the team need to be successful and this is what you have to do, you have to go down that path, regrettably. You know, it's, along the way, Get told to me a long time ago that the best cultures are ones of celebrated discontent, right? The discontent of I have to improve all the time, we kind of know. But the celebrations that allow people the time to get to know and celebrate what they have accomplished become part of it. There must have been significant time for celebration along the way in this transition with your team. Yes, there were, uh, you know, it was, um, I was talking to one of my assistants the other day and he's now a head coach in his own right. And um, he said, his boss said to him, you know, I just, I'm just so, in, you know, are, are you stressed about the situation? Cause obviously they're managing COVID. He's a college coach. And he said, now nah, pressure's being down three, one to Brazil, 10 minutes away from losing your job. <laughs> you know, and I think so there are moments that you reflect on even hard, tough moments, moments that were challenging that yes, you come away and, you, and you, you smile about it and you think about, gosh, that, you remember that and remember this. But yeah, I think there's been a lot of moments where, I think what was cool about my staff is we've, we really grew so close as a, as a unit and obviously it morphed into, into friendships, but there was always this professional atmosphere that we understood. Um, but you know, to this day, we are still very, very close, even though we're apart, but celebrating, uh, even things that people externally probably think, you know, celebrating a, a comeback against Brazil to tie the game. People think, wait, you celebrate a tie? Yeah, you had no idea what was at stake. You know, those types of things I think are um, good memories to have. For sure. Jill, do you think you had an advantage in coaching because you were a woman? I mean, I know you're actively involved in helping to raise money for and develop women's coaches in the sport to professionalize that. But there's, there's got to be a difference in the way men and women approach these things. Um, would I say it was an advantage? I actually would say probably the opposite. Um, really? I, I, I think the, and having had, you know, 25 plus years in this career, um, I think coaching is still a, you know, like most top, top level things, it's still a male dominated sport. Even female soccer is dominated, you know, in terms of percentages and ratios. And so I think the, there is a, I think a, a more fixated lens on female coaches, but I would say that's across the board. You know, I, I just saw something the other day and here's where I'm going with this. Cristiano Ronaldo, world-class soccer player, loses a big match has an absolute meltdown and people are like, gosh, he's so competitive. It matters to him. Serena Williams has a meltdown. What a brat, what this, you know, the, it's a completely different lens that people look through. What I know too, is that friends of mine that have maybe been let go because of, you know, results, other coaches get let go and they've maybe done some shady things. They get hired in a second, these the male coaches. Women, women's coaches who are fired tend to be. So it, I still think that this is a domain where women are not viewed with the same, um, the same lens. I think we are scrutinized more. You know, even if you hear people talk about females in sport, it's more about, you know, are they married? Do they have children? It, they're not talking about the prowess as an athlete. 
So I think this is an environment of sport that we really need to take a big step forward. Forget pay, because that's a whole other animal in and of itself. <laughs> so I don't think I had an advantage as a female. I actually think it, on a personal level, I think it made me more steeled, more determined, more... Um, because I've been in situations as the head coach at UCLA where the referee would walk right past me over to my male assistant and say, hey, coach, how you doing? And he'd be like, it's her. So when you come through an environment, you know, almost daily where you, I was the only female in all of my coaching licenses, I actually think that benefited me because I think it did make me more determined to, to um, you know, to, or, or maybe thicker skinned or whatever the, the saying to be able to achieve and uh, to achieve success. How about, how about in the relationship with your players? Would it be different when you think about advantages or disadvantages that way? I, you know, I think a lot of people would actually believe that, you know, being a female, understanding female, and I do think there is an element to that. You know, I think we are, you know, by nature, we're just different males and females. I also think, you know, that women, that these players, have hardly any of them have been coached by females. I was asked in the recruiting at UCLA, well, are you different? Like, is it going to be less? So you come in with females that have these preconceived notions about, well, one, I've never had a female coach and she's either going to be softer or she's going to be respectfully, you know, if we're hard and tough and determined, we're a bitch, you know, like that's sometimes <laughs> the, that's sometimes the labels that come with, with strong, confident women. So I think with my players, um, Yes, I think the, you know, regardless of gender, you try and build relationship with them. Um, but I think a lot of them hadn't had a female coach. And I just think human dynamics sometimes, I think that um, it's probably less comfortable because they've not been used to having female leaders in front of them. Joe, what are you reading? Are you reading anything um, that you find interesting? <laughs> well, I just started a book. Uh, it was... Um, it's about five leaders in conflict. It's, um, it's, a, it's a book about, uh, I love history. So it's, they t this, this author, Nance Cohen, has taken five leaders and it's called Forged in Crisis. It probably came out a few years ago, but it's like uh, Shackleton is uh, this explorer. Uh, they do Frederick Douglass. She takes these five leaders. One's an environmentalist. I haven't, obviously, I've just gotten the first piece of Shackleton. And I think what I'm attracted to and drawn to is you know, you think you're having a bad day and then you see this guy who's going across, you know, the Antarctica, 10 foot waves, nothing to eat. And you're like, wow, you know, there's just this, I'm drawn to people that have achieved remarkable things. And uh, so that's, that's interesting to me to, to read about, you know, just their mindset, their role as a leader. Um, I'm also reading, uh, I just started it because a good friend of mine, she's the uh, president of William Murray. She recommended um, Patty Smith's book, Just Kids, that uh, I haven't read it, but it's, uh, it's on my shelf as, as the next read. So I sometimes like to go into getting information and then sometimes just pure entertainment. Two leaders, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you most admired? Um, I think I would say most of my people that have influenced me have been people that I've come into close contact with. So I'm going to say, you know, my father is probably one of the best teachers of the game, um, an optimist, uh, a leader, charismatic, always got the best. And he was, he was a military guy. And he just gave me a really good model in terms of, you know, persistence, um, finding always the, the, the silver lining in something. I think he was someone that probably had the greatest influence in me. I remember, um, you know, April Heinrichs was our first head coach of the U S women's national team, first female head coach. And this was a woman that kind of showed me that you can get to these heights in terms of, um, reaching the summit in terms of your sporting coaching career. So she was someone that was very influential to me in, in showing me the pathway and, and believing in me. Uh, listen, I grew up in the time when Margaret Thatcher was the president. And I just remember thinking, well, that's a badass woman right there. You know, this is back <laughs> in the 70s and she's, you know, kicking ass and taking names as a, as a strong political leader. And, and remember thinking, gosh, women can run a country. Um, it always, it always kind of was confusing to me because when I came to this country, we, we, we've never had a female president, right? 
but yet we have all these advantages, you know, we, so Title IX, I never, I could never play soccer in England. It wasn't an option. And here there's all these opportunities that have been afforded to females and yet we're not quite ready to have a female leader. And so I just, that's the, you know, that's a little bit of a, a, a strange uh, conundrum for me. But I think those are people that I've, you know, people close to me that I've admired. Um, Again, I have a good friend. She was a head coach at Princeton. She raised three kids under three by herself and was a head coach. And I remember thinking, holy cow, if I'm having a bad day, I just need to look at her. So I think the people that have influenced me most are people that have been close to me. Um, I was fortunate to meet John Wooden, reading his stuff and, and having conversations with him. I mean, just a tremendous person um, and obviously how a successful coach. To say the least, right? And that must have been fun times at UCLA with Coach Yeah, Wooden. one of the best questions, I had to sit down with my team, and I remember one of my young players said, Coach, who's your favorite Who's your favorite NBA player? And he smiled and he said, John Stockton. And they're like, well, why him? And he said, because he wears short shorts. <laughs> I remember what everyone had adjusted to go with the long pants. I'm like, gosh, he is such a, such a great guy. A young coach comes to you. You know, uh, millennials, Gen Z coach comes in. They want one piece of advice, just one piece of advice, and says, Coach, you've reached the pinnacle of coaching. You know, I, I really admire what you've done. Is there one piece of advice you can give me that would shorten my trails as a leader in the future? Well, probably smacking with the reality is I don't think there's a shortcut to success. I think hard work is, is fundamental. So I would probably preface it with that because I think if you're, if you're in a hurry, um, things happen for a reason. But I think, I think nowadays with so much um, access to, to you, right? You, whether you have an Instagram account, Twitter account, whatever, there's so much access, which means there's so much input and opinion of you. I think my advice would be stay absolutely true to who you are. It doesn't matter how many likes something gets. It doesn't matter if you're maybe speaking out against something. It, stay true to who you are because I think, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter, she's 15, and everybody's judging everything, you know, what they wear, what they, you know, everything. And I think that this capacity to really know who you are and believe in who you are, I think that is a piece of advice that, you know, I wish I'd been given when I was younger, because I think it took me time to figure that out. But I would say don't be oversaturated by all this out there, which has an opinion of everything. Believe in what you believe and stay true to that. Great advice. Jill, thank you for taking the time with us this morning. I, I so appreciate and admire what you've done and appreciate you taking the time and I do have one thing I think I would love to share with you as you go. Yes. In my looking at your body of work and getting to know you, I found a quote that I think is so true for the humility that is every time we talk. And, and, and a quick adaptation of a, of a quote from Lao Tzu, I think fits you fine when it says, a leader is best when people barely know she exists when her work is done, her aim fulfilled, they'll say they did it themselves. Your humility is a, an absolute lesson to us all. I really want to thank you for your time. Uh, I'm honored that you were here. Thank you. And I'd also, you're welcome. And I'd also like to thank the Washington Speakers Bureau for making this conversation possible and for their continued support of these conversations that help move the body of knowledge forward so that we can build better cultures that are both more effective, more human, and can help unleash the human potential. Thanks, Jill, and thank you for joining in. We'd love to hear from those of you who've listened. We'd love to know what you think about our program, and we'd love to get to know you better. Thank you very much.